I want to say uh, <clears throat> good morning uh, and greetings once again to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to welcome you to another teaching from Covenant of Grace Ministries, Tennessee. Thank you for your time and I want to thank you for your support of our channel. Today, I want to continue with our teaching that we've been doing on stewardship. We shared with you, a steward is a manager. And uh, the last sermon we did on this topic, we talked about the management responsibilities that we have as Christians. And we talked about two major purposes and responsibilities that uh, we have as Christians. The first responsibility we talked about in the last teaching, we talked about our responsibility as a resource manager. As you remember, God placed us in the Garden of Eden. He created all of this beautiful work, but there was nobody to manage or to cultivate the garden. So the first responsibility he gave us as managers we're resource managers. And we talked about the second responsibility that we had and that responsibility was the great commission, the teaching and preaching and sharing with the gospel, the sharing of the gospel so we could bring people back into a fiduciary responsibility, a trust responsibility with Yahweh. So today we're gonna to continue <clears throat> on our teaching. And today we're gonna to be talking about stewardship. And again, we're gonna be talking about management, the power of planning, the power of planning under stewardship. Our main scripture is gonna come from Proverbs 29 and 18. So <clears throat> let's move right into today's teaching. Proverbs 29 and 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So let's get into the interpretation of this particular scripture, where there is no vision, the people perish. So vision is a revelation, revelation or oracle from Yahweh. So this vision means that we have received revelation knowledge directly from God, or we have received an oracle from God. Uh, the end of the day, we have knowledge of God's <clears throat> word, okay? This knowledge of God's word. Now, revelation is a manifestation of Yahweh. And when I say manifestation, I'm not just saying that you are aware of who God is. We're talking about a deep manifestation and understanding, a detailed revelation and understanding of who God is, not just a general awareness of him, but a special awareness and a detailed understanding of who he is and what his plan is for your life, okay? So that's the first part of this vision. And with, without that knowledge of who he is, a detailed knowledge of who he is and what his plan is about, then you have no vision. <clears throat> and when we have no vision, the scripture, the scripture said the people perish. So we're seeing today we're in perilous times and we're seeing a lot of people that are perishing because they have no vision, they have no knowledge, they have no understanding of who God is. Now, this oracle is a person with great wisdom who receives revelation from God, okay? So when you have an oracle from God, you can have a prophet, you can have a preacher, but they're bringing you the actual true word of God. 
they're just repeating to you what God has said to them in order to share that wisdom with you, okay? So they've received it from God and they're sharing it with you, sort of like what I'm doing this morning, okay? Now, let's go deeper. And you're probably asking the question, why are we talking about a vision? Because a vision and planning go together. Without a vision, you cannot put together a godly or correct plan. So you need to have either a direct vision from God or Yahweh, or you need an indirect vision from somebody who has the oracles of God and can share that particular message with you. Now, vision is so important to planning because vision gives you the ability to see what others cannot see, okay? This is your competitive advantage as a Christian when you have a vision from God, okay? You can see things and you can understand things that other people cannot. So it's the ability to see what others cannot. And then it, we go on here with our definition and we say that faith sees what the eyes cannot see. That's the beauty of faith. Faith gives us the ability to see into the spirit world. So let's talk about that. Faith sees with the mind. Very important concept. Faith gives you the ability to see things. It gives you the ability to have a vision. You see these things with your mind, not your eyes. So faith gives you the vision to see things with your mind that your eyes cannot see. I know that's a very heavy statement and we're gonna be going into some very heavy teaching and some of these teachings, I know we're gonna lose some of our people because they're not going to be able to grasp some of these concepts because they're not, some people are not gonna have the patience to stay with the things that we're trying to teach on this channel. Okay, so faith sees what the eyes cannot see. The eyes, the eyes sees physical things, but faith sees, okay? Faith sees spiritual things. So without faith, we cannot please God. So let's move on in now, since we established the relationship of vision to planning, you gotta have the correct vision from God to know what kind of plan you need to put together. Now, we move over to 2 Timothy 4 and 3. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, that time is here now. We're living in that time. People will not endure sound doctrine. Now, one of the challenges that Pastor Williams and I have right now on this YouTube network is people will not endure sound doctrine. And that's our commitment on this particular network is to preach sound doctrine straight from the scripture. But a lot of people are not interested in sound doctrine. We see that by the, the number of views that we get. But look what else the scripture says, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So what, what that is saying, people want to hear things that entertain them, okay? They, they, they like the value of entertaining instead of the value of knowledge. And the problem we have right now, you see for yourself, the kinds of things that go viral are the things that entertain people. When people are entertained, they share the video and they do all sorts of things, but they don't want to endure sound teaching. Now, there's just 
praise God, there's a remnant of us who are committed to sound doctrine. And for those that are part of this remnant, <clears throat> this remnant, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to stay with us as we continue to teach. And over the process of time, you're going to reap the benefits of it. Most people no longer have an ear to hear from Yahweh. Therefore, they cannot follow his plan. So many of us are way too busy that we can't sit down and listen to what Yahweh has to say so he can reveal to us the revelation that we need so we can maneuver through the perilous times which we are in. Now, let's go into this a little deeper. We're going to connect vision to planning. And let's see what Yeshua had to say in Luke 14, 28 through 32. For which of you intending to build a tower, sit it not down first, and do what? Count it the cost. Whether he will have sufficiency to what? Finish it. Least happily, after he have laid the foundation and is not able to what? He's not able to uh, finish it all that behold, he began to be what mocked, saying what? This man has begun to build and was not able to finish. So let's deal with the first part of this scripture. Now, this is planning because we're talking about a future event. Look what it says, intending to build. That's a plan. That's a plan to build something into the future. It hadn't happened yet. So anytime you see that word intending, that means somebody is planning to do something. But part of that plan that Christ is talking about is also you need to sit down and you need to first what? count the cost of what kind of resources you're going to need if you're going to build this tower so you will have sufficient resources to complete the plan. Now, if you lay the foundation and you haven't thought through and you haven't planned it out, planned out what you're going to need, you're going to be unable to finish the project and you will be mocked, okay? Saying, look, he started this thing, and he was unable to finish it. You know, in life, people start a lot of things that they're unable to finish. Finishing is completing what you started, simple definition, but so many things in life go, they go uncompleted. People start things and leave them, what, incomplete. So Christ is teaching here about the process of planning. The second part, he says, what king going to make war against another king does what? Sit it not down first and consult it, whether he's able with 10,000 mans, 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with what? 20,000. That's planning, understanding what you're up against. Mm. Understanding what you're up against. And most of us at this time in our lives, we're up against a lot of stuff. I can only speak personally. I'm, I'm fighting warfare on a number of fronts in my life right now. So I'm spending an extensive amount of time planning, putting together godly plans because of all of these battles that I have in my life right now. I need to have a good process of planning if I intend to be victorious in these particular battles. Now, so what plan do you have in place for the things you're facing right now? Do you have a plan at all? Is your plan a godly plan? Or 
or you're doing like a lot of people are doing these days, just winging it. Just one day at a time, winging it, no plan at all. Whatever comes up, comes up. Now, so the lack of a godly plan leads most people into defeat. All right? <clears throat> That's why we're covering this. Again, in all of these teachings, we have been talking about getting ourselves prepared for what's to come and what's already here. So we need a plan to do that. So let's talk about this. <clears throat> what is a plan? First of all, if it's a godly plan, it's gonna have at least three components that I wanna talk to you about. These are critical foundational components to any plan. The first component is faith. Yes, remember we talked about faith gives us vision. Faith gives us the ability to see into the spirit world. And when I say see, I'm talking about seeing things with our mind and understanding things with our minds, okay? We've been given a mandate and we've given responsibility to have dominion over the earth, okay? So you can't take dominion over things until you understand how they work, okay? You can't take dominion until you understand how things work. And faith can give you the vision to see into the spirit world, to see how things really work. So one of the things I want you to understand, faith is a knowledge system. Faith gives you knowledge, it gives you vision, it gives you understanding of how things work. So all good plans start with faith, a foundation of faith in God and faith in God's plan. God has a plan for us. Most of us have gotten so religious, we get born again and we never learn what the plan is and we never follow the plan. The second component of a good godly plan is wisdom. Wisdom takes the knowledge that we've received from faith here. Wisdom takes that knowledge and wisdom is the application. It is the correct application of that knowledge, okay? All right, and this last one here should also not only is knowledge, but we should have patience with the plan. We've got, once we receive that faith, wisdom, knowledge, we need patience to let the plan have an opportunity to develop. Faith, wisdom, knowledge, patience. Okay, you got it? So let's look at what is a plan. A plan is organized knowledge. It's just not uh, disorganized, okay? God is not a God of confusion. So when you look at the scripture, the Holy Scriptures are organized knowledge, the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? This is how we start with a good plan. Organized knowledge is that is actionable. Other words, I can study it once I get the vision, once I understand it, then I'm in a position to take action so I can be actionable. In other words, action is application. See, wisdom, application is actionable. But if I don't spend time to study, the organized knowledge, as the scripture says, study to show thyself approved. If I miss this first point here and I don't come away from the organized knowledge with understanding, then I'm going to misappropriate in my action plan. I'm going to be appropriating or applying the knowledge incorrectly. All right? Now, when we move on, 
is linked to the purpose of solving, watch this, we got a lot of problems in our lives, is linked to a purpose of what? Solving a problem and creating value. When I solve a problem, I develop skills. And when my skills are developed, right? I'm creating value when I solve problems. Now notice the scripture says, I said the word skills. The Bible talks about us being unskilled in the word of righteousness. So we've got to study to become what? Skilled in order to solve all these problems that we're dealing with in our lives. A good plan is a bridge from your current situation to a better future. Now, I want you to stop right here because I'm gonna, I'm, I wanna ask you, how good is your plan? I'm pausing again, and then I'm gonna ask the same question. How good is your plan right now? In life, we have two options for dealing with trials, tribulations, and adversity. Remember the scripture where Christ said, in the world, and that's where we are, it says you will have what? Tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So let's talk about the options we have for dealing with with trials, tribulations, and adversity. And the reasons we gotta have patience to go along with our faith and wisdom, because when trials and tribulations and adversity come, patience gives us the ability to endure these trials and tribulations without becoming what? Angry, frustrated, or emotional. Follow me? A plan is important, but patience with your plan is also very, very important because you've got to give your plan an opportunity to develop. And without patience, you'll become frustrated and you'll give up on your plan before it has an opportunity to develop. And when you start with a godly plan, you trust that plan, okay? You stay with that plan and you have the patience to allow that plan to develop. So here's our two options, panic, which so many people are doing right now, panic and worry, that's an option. You can choose to panic and worry. It's not a good choice. You can panic and worry, or you can go about planning. Every good plan plans for trials. Every good plan plans for tribulations. Every good plan plans for adversity. These are things that are going to come up against us while we're in the world. That's why the Bible refers to it as spiritual warfare. But so many of us, we're in a war without a plan, dangerous situation. Let's move on. Now these two options we got, panic and worry, leads to emotional and short-term reaction, usually with wrong decisions that's that's where panic and worry gets us we end up making bad decisions or wrong choices okay now here's our other option planning anticipates problems and has the wisdom knowledge and understanding in the process of problem solving I've, I've, I've discovered in my 63 years, I've discovered that the Holy Scriptures are a great place to receive wisdom, knowledge, and understanding 
and they are also a great place for, found, for getting a foundation in problem solving. Now, let's look at these two options. Out of these two options, both panic and worry and planning requires same amount of energy. You're gonna burn energy in either one of them. If you panic and worry, you burn energy. If you plan, you're gonna burn energy. But planning yields better results, particularly when it's a godly plan, okay? Now, I want to talk about a concept. I've introduced this concept in some of my previous sermons. I want to talk about this concept of how much the leverage, how much leverage do you have in your plan? And leverage, spiritual leverage is a concept that comes out of the Bible. And, and I want to uh, draw off of a sermon that Pastor Williams used and I gave him feedback on when he talked about, uh, uh, he was telling a story about a high jumper and a pole vaulter. And I'm gonna be quick with this. The high jumper has to use all of his energy to get over the bar. He has no help. He has to do all the jumping on his own, the high jump. So he's going in, trying to clear the bar solo, depending on all of his own personal energy and ability. Well, that's where a lot of us are in the Christian life. Sadly to say, we want to be high jumpers. And when I say we want to be high jumpers, we want to do it all on our own so-called power and ability, which is really inability to try and get across the bar. But the difference between the high jumper and the pole vaulter, the pole vaulter has a pole. And the pole gives the pole vaulter leverage. So the pole vaulter can jump, at least from the statistics that I've seen, at least two and a half times higher, okay, than the high jumper guy. Because the high jumper guy doesn't have the advantage of the pole. What I want you to understand the pole gives you leverage. What leverage does? Leverage gives you stronger, higher, better results when it's used, particularly spiritual leverage. Most of my people are going through life with no leverage. And when you have a plan with no leverage, you've got to do it all by yourself. And when you try and go through life all by yourself with no spiritual leverage, life will only get harder. Now, with that background, let's go into this teaching from Christ. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles. They were rolling with Jesus because of the miracles he had did, which he had did on them that were diseased. Jesus was going around healing all of these diseased people. So he had a big crowd following him. And Jesus went up into the mountains and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Jesus saw all of these people and he was testing his disciples. He knew what he was going to do, but he asked, he asked, he said unto Philip, 
um, trans translating and 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 how are we gonna feed all these people, Philip? Plain English, how are we gonna feed all these folks? There's a multitude here. And this his disciples said, I mean, and this he said, look, it's telling you right here. He said this to what? Test, to test him, to prove him. He said this to Philip to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Oh, y'all need to stay with me now. Holy Spirit is preaching up in here this morning. Philip answered him. He thinking, Philip thinking in terms of money now, right? 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them should take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said unto him, there is a lad here which have what? Five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? See, see how we look at resources? The, the, the lad, the young boy has five loaves of bread and he has two small fish. And Simon Peter's brother said, what are they among so many? Now I want you to watch Yeshua's Christ response. <clears throat> Christ says, make the men <clears throat> sit down. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing the leverage? He's getting ready to feed the multitude. But what are they doing? He tells them to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in a number. Look at this, 5,000. And when Jesus took the loaves, and when he, look, he gave thanks. Jesus took what he had. Look at the planning, look at the stewardship. He took what he had and the scripture says he gave thanks. How many of us have given thanks for what we already have? No matter how small it is, have you, have you thanked God for what you've already had? So many people are chasing more. And you haven't given thanks to God for what you already have. I remember a long time ago, I was in a cafe drinking a cup of coffee and I asked the waiter, I say, I need a little bit more sugar to go in this coffee. And I'll never forget what she told me. She says, have you stirred what you got already. Now you could have taken that or she being smart with me. No, but I took it as a teacher. And my, the takeaway I took out of that long time ago in some little hick town restaurant somewhere down in Mississippi, I learned how to stir what's already in my coffee because it's already at the bottom of my cup. And I think in this life, we need to learn how to give thanks for what God has already done. We're always praying, we're always asking for more, but have you given thanks for what you already have? Okay? He, Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, right, he distributed to his disciples and disciples to them that were set down and likewise of what? To two fish as much as they would. Okay, he just took two fish, five loaves of bread, fed 5,000 people. People, that's leverage. That's spiritual leverage. You need to understand this. And they were filled up. He said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments 
that remain that nothing be lost. See, we've got to learn how to gather up the fragments too. Not only do we not thank the Lord for what he's already given us, we don't do a good job of gathering up the fragments that remain. We don't, we shouldn't throw away anything. Don't throw away anything of value that God has given to you, okay? I have a concept that I call that I developed from the Bible, from this particular scripture that I want to share with you. I have a process I call fragment management. Yes, what's fragment management? You take the leftovers and you don't let them go to waste. That's how you do fragment management. No matter how small it is, don't let it go to waste. In finance, it can be a nickel, quarter, dollar that's left over, left over change. Manage those fragments. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments. They filled 12 baskets with the fragments of leftovers of the five barley loaves, which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. <clears throat> then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth that prophet should come into the world. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him, okay, by force to make him a king, he departed again to the mountain, henceforth alone. Now they saw Jesus use this leverage concept. And they were ready to make him king. They've seen him heal diseased people. And they've seen him take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed over 5,000 people. So they want to take him by force, man. We, we want you to be king. Well, let me share with you something he's done even greater than feeding the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. He defeated death. He rose from the grave. He lived a sinless life. He shed his blood through his death, burial, and resurrection. He wants to be our king. But some of us has rejected him as our king. And when you reject him, you still have a sin problem. And if you don't accept him, you will die in your sin. And you don't want that to happen. You want to go to sleep in Christ. So let's break down this concept of spiritual leverage. Benefits in greater proportion than input. Okay, what was the input? Five loaves of bread, two small fish. What was the benefit? Fed over 5,000, because it was 5,000 men, but there were women and children. If you read some of the other gospel books, so the benefit, the input was small, but the benefit was great because of the number of people he fed. That's spiritual leverage. But what did he do? before he distributed that to the people, <clears throat> where did he look? <clears throat> he looked to heaven. He gave thanks. How many of us are looking to heaven and giving thanks? That should be part of your plan. 
Yahshua fed the multitude with two fish and five loaves of bread. Here's the principle I want you to take away. Small things that are blessed by heaven multiply into big things. I'm gonna say this again. Small things that are blessed by heaven. Has, has the things in your hand been blessed by heaven? They multiply into what? Big things. Go back to the beginning. What did God tell us in the book of Genesis? He said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for the teaching you're releasing at this moment to this audience who have taken the time to visit this site. Lord, I ask you to bless these people. Bless them through the word that you've given me this morning. Be fruitful and multiply. No matter how small it is, whatever you have that God has given to you to be a steward over, to be a manager over it, I want you to have a thankful, thankful attitude, okay? And I want you to learn these teachings that we're putting out here on stewardship. And if you stay with us, those things, no matter how small they are, through these teachings, you're going to be able to, to, to multiply these into big things. Praise God. Now, let's look at some principles of spiritual leverage, because we want to develop a plan that has leverage in it. So let's look at some key principles of leverage, spiritual leverage. You don't think about this. Words are a form of leverage. The words, the thoughts, see thoughts come from words. The words, the thoughts deposited in your mind and spirit, that's leverage. You, you either got godly words deposited in you, or you got wicked words deposited in you. Either way, they're leverage. The wicked words are leverage in the wrong direction. But if you've got godly words deposited in your spirit, in your mind, from the scripture, you have some powerful leverage tools. So what we're teaching on this site a powerful spiritual leverage tool. I know I'm gonna lose some people with this teaching, but you got to study to show yourself approved. You gotta come to the site. You gotta come to the website. You can't, you can't listen to this stuff one time and say, you got it. You can't listen to it one time and say, oh, he just preaching the same stuff. I already know that. But look at where we are. Look at, use your measurement tool of how well you're studying. Look at where we are in life. You might be satisfied with where you are, but I'm not. I, I want to push forward. I want to learn more. So words are powerful spiritual leverage tools. Look at Proverbs 23 and 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are established by how you think. Yes, what's in your heart is going to establish you in life. It all begins with words. The scripture says what? In the beginning was the word the word, okay? Eat and drink, said he, but his heart is not with thee. So we're looking for, we eating and drinking and playing politics with people and we think they're gonna deliver us, but their heart is not with you. They whining and dining you to take advantage of you. The spirit just told me to share this with you. He says, 
most of my people are somebody else's leverage. Yes, instead of, instead of us having leverage in our plan, we're in somebody else's plan and somebody else is leveraging us. Somebody else is using us to get to their objectives and their goals and to solve their problems, okay? So if you're not using leverage, then you are somebody else's leverage. They're using you to get what they want. Oh, please listen. Let's move again. Not only are words leverage, I want to talk about the leverage of your decisions and actions. Here's a problem. 95% of the people make decisions, but take no actions. So how is your plan ever going to come into existence? You make all these decisions, but you take no actions to follow through with. And here's what decisions and actions are important. Both of them go together. See, I have set before you, before the, this day, life and death, good, life and good, and death and evil. Life is full of what? Choices, decisions, decisions that's got to be followed by action. Five birds sitting on the fence. Two of them make a decision to fly away. How many birds are on the fence? <laughs> Think about it. Two of them made a decision to fly away. They made a decision to fly away, but does that mean they flew away? <laughs> You're going to get that. Stay with it. The leverage of group economics and aggregation. We're disseminating some powerful leverage principles. And the multitude of them that bleed were of what? One heart and of what? One soul. Neither any of them that out of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon what? Them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. All right, you see what's happening here? Do you see the power? This was the early church. They functioned in economics as a group, not individually, not like what you see in the world. This was not every man for himself. Read the scripture for yourself. They sold everything that they had and they aggregated it. They were functioning under the concept, the modern day concept of group economics. This is a concept that the church has lost this concept. The church is not implementing this group economic concept the way we should be implementing it. Let me talk to some things, people. The people in the world are using this concept better than Christians are using it. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to this. People know, people know, corporations know how to function under group economics and aggregation better than the church does.
So we look at, let's, let's recap a few things. The leverage of your words, the leverage of your decisions and action, the leverage of group economics. I'm giving you a list, but this list is not complete of all the leverage you can have. The leverage of unity and collaboration, <laughs> working together. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had what? All things common. Again, all right? The leverage of unity and collaboration. This is unity and collaboration. And then this is what, this is foundational here. You got to have unity and collaboration up front before you can do the second part. And then they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Okay, you can't practice group economics and aggregation unless you have some unity and collaboration in your group. And having preached the gospel as long as I have, been a pastor and a retired pastor, unity and collaboration is a huge issue. It's, it's very difficult to bring our people together in unity and collaboration. The church has only been able to do this on a small scale, not on the large scale. So what we're doing here, we're not developing our full potential. This group in the early church had togetherness. They had unity. They understood group economics. They understood the leverage of your thoughts and your words. They understood the leverage of decisions and actions. That's why they were so successful. Okay. The leverage of service. Now we're in a society now, nobody wants to serve, everybody wants to be served. And there was strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that do serve for what for whether is greater for whether whether is greater who's greater he that sitteth at me or he that serveth is not he that sitteth at me it's not him that sitteth but i am among you as he that serveth mm. what a shift the greatest is the one that serves. The greatest is the servant of the minister. This subject we're talking about is so important. Most churches in Bona Green Christians have not been properly trained in stewardship. You are a manager and managers are responsible for planning. How good is your plan. Do you have a plan? These concepts that I'm talking about, I've done an extensive evaluation. I've been inside corporations. I've been inside the church. And I'm here to tell you today that my experience has been these leverage principles that I'm talking about Corporations that have pulled these concepts out of the Bible and corporations are using these concepts more effectively 
than the churches. We've gotten so religious in the church that in a lot of cases, we're not even interpreting the Bible correctly. We're not even drilling down on these concepts. And I know that the teachings that I'm doing, I will get through to a remnant, but I will be so excited if the remnant is able to grasp these concepts, apply them in their lives, because as we enter these perilous times that we're in, we're going to need these concepts to get through. Praise the Lord. If you've been blessed by the message and would like to donate to the ministry, feel free to plant a seed. You can cash app us, dollar COG Tennessee 123, or you can mail us at 1705 Ghost Creek Drive, Collierville, Tennessee. We would like for you to subscribe to our channel, and we would like for you to share our channel in your circle of influence with your family and friends so they can be blessed, so the Lord can be glorified. We thank you for your time and my next opportunity that the Lord blesses me to be up. I'm gonna continue with this teaching I've been doing on stewardship. I hope you've been blessed. Thank you. <laughs>